Welcome here. I am Pastor Isaiah. I am so glad you could join us this Sunday for worship. Uh, I'm going to quickly get us through a few announcements, and then we will continue on in worship. First, I hope you're all enjoying our VBS videos that are getting posted on Wednesday. Um, If you haven't had a chance to come by the church and pick up the takeout for VBS, uh, please do so. We have some things in there that I think you all enjoy. They also include our songbook. So if you have, if you have picked up your takeout and you, haven't, and you don't have the songbook with you right now, please pause the video, go grab the songbook so that you can sing along with us today. Um, yes, and also, speaking of which, for when you pick up, we have changed our office hours here at the church for the summer. So rather than meet uh, Monday to Friday from 9 to 12, Our office hours are Monday to Thursday from 9 to 12. So just that you're all aware of that, uh, if you come here Friday morning, uh, Laura will not be in the office. So (laughs) just be aware of that. Um, Also, we are having our second backyard gathering this summer. So if you would like to join us for that and you call First Church your home church, then please just let us at the office know and we would gladly... uh, let you know what's going on. We have sent out an email with the directions to where we're going to meet. Uh, We are just trying to figure out how many people are about going to come to our backyard gathering. Um, I believe that is everything. So if you would bow your head in prayer with me, that would be wonderful. Gracious Father, we pray for your holy church. Fill it with all truth. In all truth, with all peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is in error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is in want, provide for it. And where it is divided, reunite it. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. We ask that you'll be with us in our time of worship and that our thoughts, words, and deeds be glorifying and pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now we will continue our worship in song. This is my Father's word. I am reading from the book of Psalms, Psalm 65, verses 1 to 8. This is a Psalm of David. What mighty praise, O God, belongs to you in Zion. We will fulfill our vows to you, for you answer our prayers. All of us must come to you. 
Though we are overwhelmed by our sins, you forgive them all. What joy for those you choose to bring near, those who live in your holy courts. What festivities await us inside your holy temple. You faithfully answer our prayers with awesome deeds. O God, our Savior, you are the hope of everyone on earth, even those who sail on the distant seas. You formed the mountains by your power and armed yourself with mighty strength. You quieted the raging oceans with their pounding waves and silenced the, the shouting of, of the nations. Those who live at the ends of the earth stand in awe of your wonders. From where the sun rises to where it sets, you inspire shouts of joy. This is the word of the Lord, and we answer thanks be to God.
What God actually called me is great. So of course, that's the term I prefer. Anywho, let me tell you about what went down. Jonah. <laughs> they came back up again. <laughs> but not for three whole awful days. Time to make you think of me. Ugh. God wanted me to learn to trust him. And also to ingest, uh, no, ingest, <laughs> trust me, Twain't no joke, but ingest like I want to swallow this guy, Jonah, that's what God said, I was like, what a great man, <laughs> they probably taste nasty, those people that live up on the land are full of dirt, so I was not wanting any of that. I've heard that people are an acquired taste, so I just swam off in the other direction. Wait, Will sounds innocent of swimming, but it's disobedience hoping to get away from God. But what do you know, God had great things planned, like he always does. Before long, I was swimming along, and you know how when you're riding your bike and you get a bug down your throat? I was swimming along and I got this guy right down my throat all of a sudden. And started yelling and was kicking and screaming. Oh my goodness. <laughs> how do you like that? Something girling and tossing and turning inside your stomach. And then yelling. I couldn't stand all the yelling. He just kept saying, God, it's me, Jonah. That's how I know his name. Get me out of here, it stinks here. Yeah, well, you ain't no picnic either, buddy. Mmm, <laughs> picnic. Reminds me of Tarshish fried fish buckets. Mmm, with a seaweed side. The best I could hope for was to lay low and let this, uh, uh, a pass. Trust me, I did not like the sound of that. Well, it took me three days for the both of us to realize that we can't try to swim away from God. So we prayed and we trusted. He even did a little singing, How Great Thou Art. <laughs> and then God directed me back, took me close to the shore. And he said, go ahead, spew him out. And I said, what? He said, yep, put him up on the land. And I was not excited about that. But then I was, all the dry land. And he was full of stinky, slimy seaweed, but he was safe. And he was saved to share salvation, share that great message of God. Great, huh? Well, that's my story, and now you know my side. Thanks for listening. Well, there is something impacting about the story of Jonah. It captures our imagination. It tends to stick with us. And whether you grew up in the church or not, lots of people have heard the story of God's prophet Jonah. Some of you may have grown up with the flannel graph teaching during Sunday school. The difficulty has to do when we think of Jonah that the story is maybe a little different. The story we remember is a little different than from what Scripture actually says. Lots of people, they remember a man running from God, and then there's this fogginess, and you think of, oh, but he was being... Uh, chased by a huge whale named Monstro that ate the man, and uh, maybe there was a puppet in there. Uh, maybe this guy named Ahab who was trying to harpoon the whale, which was white. And all of that isn't actually part of the biblical story. Yes, it's a story of a whale, a great fish, but that's really only a portion of the story. And we hear sometimes the 
the idea of Jonah, and we think of it this way, he rebelled and then was obedient. But there's more to it than that. This week's VBS memory verse is, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord. That's from Jonah 3.3. And then we think it went swimmingly. Yes, I I went there. (laughs) Sure, Jonah rebelled at first, but then, then he did what God asked him. That's what we think. But I think Jonah's life is really a lesson about getting out of the boat in the worst kind of way. The worst kind of obedience to God's word with the worst kind of attitude. Now I'm getting ahead of myself. So let me set the scene for those of you who don't know anything about Jonah. This is new to you. Jonah is a prophet of God. And prophets were set apart from other religious leaders. They helped deliver the messages that the Lord uh, had for his people. Sometimes those messages got lost because the priests and other religious leaders had begun to sin and they rebelled against God. And so the prophet was tasked by God to bring God's current word to the people. So this morning's passage of Scripture I'm just going to read, we're covering all of the book of Jonah, but I'm going to read a few verses now. Jonah chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port, And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. So when Jonah's God cell phone rings, the word of the Lord, it says, came to Jonah. That's the ringtone God would give the prophet. Unlike the apostle Peter, who stepped out of the boat to walk on the water when Jesus called to him, the prophet Jonah Here's God's call to him, and not only does he get in the boat, but he goes to the bottom of the boat and goes as far away from the Lord as he could go. Scholars tell us that Tarshish, where Jonah was headed, was at the far end of the world. Now, if you stop and think about your life for a moment, and you think about God's call on you, then Maybe you can think of, well, there have been times when I haven't been completely faithful or obedient. Maybe you've done like Jonah and you've gone the complete opposite direction. I want to encourage us today to see that the book of Jonah is filled with great irony. In a lot of ways, it's like a comedy. Prophets were given the messages from the Lord to deliver so that people could be saved. And here is the prophet, God's messenger, Jonah, rebelling. At the beginning, we see God calls to Jonah to go to the great city of Nineveh. It's great, why? Because its size, yes, the number of people, but its sins are great. In fact, the passage says that they had come up before the Lord. This is a reference to when you think about God in Genesis hearing and seeing what is happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. The sins of those cities rose up to the Lord. And so Nineveh is having the same kind of effect on God, is that the sins of that city are great and they rise up. And so Nineveh is east of where Jonah lives and Jonah boards a ship headed west as far as he can go, thousands of kilometers. It's not that Jonah didn't hear from God. He simply wasn't happy with the message. He wasn't obedient to God's calling. And in a great many ways, Jonah had forgotten God's greatness, the greatness of the God he served, Almighty God. God called Jonah to the great city of Nineveh, and Jonah runs And then God sends a great wind, the passage says. And that great wind stirs up a great storm, which causes the crew of the ship, who are now 
Many of them, I assume, are seasoned sailors who've traveled the ocean far and wide, perhaps have made the trek to Tarshish before those thousands of kilometers on the ocean, on the sea. They're filled with great fear. And as they try to deal with the storm and save the ship and all the people aboard, they begin to say, something is amiss here. And so they start to pray to their gods. Then not hearing any response or seeing any result, they begin to cast lots to figure out where is this problem coming from? And the lot that is cast falls to Jonah. Jonah finally owns up to his rebellion and tells them, it's, it's me. And you if you want to be saved, have to help me get out of the boat. And so, toss me out into the sea. I want us to remember when we think of this story that Jonah's request is happening while there's still the great wind and there's still the great storm. All of that is still going on and so his instruction to throw him overboard was probably in a lot uh, a sense of accepting his death. But God is great. And he shows Jonah great mercy in that the passage says, the Lord provides a a great fish, huge fish to swallow Jonah. And that word provide is actually the same word that is used to talk about appointments or commissioning. It's this idea of ruling kings of authority, appointing people. God has appointed Jonah to be the prophet to deliver his message to Nineveh, and he's refused. But instead of letting him die, the Lord appoints a huge, great fish, a whale, to give him safe journey back to shore. Now, through this time, I think Jonah has been given a a time out, if you will, to reflect. And as he's in the belly of the beast, deep under the waves, he cries out to God. He cries out for help. And we read in Jonah chapter 2, he even sings a psalm of, of salvation from God. I was under the waves. I was in distress and I called to my Lord. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry for help. God directs the fish, the great fish, to spew him out, to vomit him out on the shore. And there, once on the shore, Jonah is now, I'm sure, stinking of seaweed and shrimp and whatever other uh, food the whale has in his stomach. Maybe he's even looking a little whiter than usual because of the stomach acids of the fish have, have maybe bleached his skin. And he makes this trek through the desert to the great city of Nineveh. The passage says that while he's there, he preaches for three days and three nights. He's there from city gate to city gate, from corner to corner. That's why it takes three days for him to let everyone know the message from the Lord, that their sin is great, but God is offering them a way out. If they would repent, and once everyone has heard the message from God, from the poorest all the way up to the king of Nineveh, they all repent. They turn from their sin and they follow God. That is amazing. I mean, for any person to share their story, share God's message, and to have everyone respond, you think you'd be excited. And what is Jonah's reaction? Does he do backflips and and filled with such joy because of his great success of the commission that he's been given? No. Jonah becomes angry. What? Yeah. Yeah. He becomes angry. Apparently, his obedience that he learned in the belly of the great fish that served him up has now turned sour for Jonah. His obedience to deliver God's message actually became worse than his rebellion when he ran from God. The prophet is so upset that God is great that he's filled with compassion and mercy on those stinking Ninevites. 
that he's now toxic. Jonah climbs up onto a hill overlooking the city of Nineveh. His intent is actually to watch the city be destroyed by God's wrath. And when God shows mercy, he's fuming with anger to the Lord. It's an interesting story. Interesting for us to to see. And I can't help, as I read this story, to see someone else between the lines. It's interesting as you look back in other scripture passages that mention the prophet Jonah. Bible scholars tell us that Jonah comes from Gath Hefer, which happens to be three miles east of a little town called Nazareth. In the New Testament, a prophet comes from the town of Nazareth who brings good news. Hmm, interesting. As Jonah flees God's call to go to Nineveh and he boards the boat and he's there and this huge wind whips up a huge great storm, Jonah falls asleep in the boat during the storm. Hmm. Jonah then, after being tossed over as he got out of the boat with the help of the sailors, goes under the water into the depths of the earth, so to speak, for three days and three nights, only then to be vomited from the depths so that he could bring a message from God, a message of hope and deliverance. It's hard not to see the life of Jesus as we read Jonah. Now, why should the story of Jonah matter to us? I think it helps all of us who are seeking to follow Jesus to truly be surrendered to God and his amazing love and his great grace. There's a danger for all of us whenever we come to Scripture and we put ourselves always in the place of we're the ones that are right, we're the ones that are the best. Here in the book of Jonah, he's following God's instruction, he's being obedient, but he's not letting God's mercy and compassion transform his heart. To people like Jonah, God's love, grace, and compassion, they seem reckless. God, you're not holding them accountable. That's the great sinful city of Nineveh. Caution for all who follow Jesus as we read this passage and through the book of Jonah is to take a look at what's going on in our hearts. Do we genuinely serve God? Do we genuinely look to others and hope that God's mercy and grace and compassion would be received? There's a great many people who don't live in relationship with God, who look to the church and they just see a bunch of Jonas. They just see a bunch of people who say that they follow God, but are not loving whatsoever. People look to the church and say, I don't go because it's filled with hypocrites. And the story of Jonah can be a correction for us to say, is that us? Is that me? Am I really serving God with all my heart? Do I really desire the best for others? As Christ followers, as Jesus followers, we need to let God's love, his grace and mercy wash over us to change and transform us. Today, I want to encourage you to let the Holy Spirit show you your heart. To show you if you are genuinely following Jesus. Are you truly obedient? Or are you like Jonah? Simply giving lip service. All the while you're hoping that people will get punished. Or are you really seeking the good that God has for them? Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, as we read this passage, this book, we can't help but see so many rich lessons for us. The foreshadowing of you, Jesus, in the Old Testament. Centuries before you were born, centuries before you declared in full the good news, the grace of God. And before you went to the cross, Jonah becomes an example for us to really let your death and resurrection transform us with a love far greater than we could ever find by obeying the law. Holy Spirit, forgive us for those times where maybe we've held on to bitterness and anger at those around us. Help us to see people with your eyes and to see and understand you are a truly great God who is filled with mercy, who is compassionate and slow to get angry. I pray that you would help us, O God, to be your people, that will share the hope that is found in you, Jesus. And we ask these things today in your mighty name. Amen.
shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, I you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. And now receive the benediction, the good word. Now may God grant us the vision of his kingdom, forgiveness and new life, and the stirring of his Holy Spirit, so that we may share his vision, proclaim his love, and change the world in the name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Thanks for joining us. I look forward to seeing you soon.